Hi, I'm Mary Greendale, and this is Just Thinking. It's election time in Holliston, and it's hard to believe there is an election going on because there's so much else going on. So I'm here today to interview Mary Catherine Savard, who is running for the school committee. I am interviewing all three candidates who are running for two seats and asking them a series of questions. Each of them will respond to the questions as they see fit, and then you and I get to decide whose response is best, best fit for us. I want to do a little bit of a backdrop about the schools right now, just in case people aren't really thinking about it. But right now there is a pretty stressful time going on up there. Um, they'll be looking for a new superintendent. Uh, the committee is in negotiations with the teachers union. We have um, no idea what's going to happen in the fall. <laughs> Nobody does, really. And right now, online education is, is working better than it did at the beginning, but so far, I think we all have to say there's still room for improvement. Um, we've talked about, or they've voted, to open schools uh, later for the middle school and high school this fall, so that would be another activity transition or whatever. There could be huge budget changes uh, this year. Um, we don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening to local receipts, um, but certainly the state's receipts are not doing too well. So there's a lot going on, but let's get to this and let's just introduce you to Mary, Mary Catherine. And um, why don't you tell us about yourself and you know why you ran at this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, hi, thank you for having me. Um, I am Mary Catherine Savard. Um, I'm a mom of three here in Holliston. Um, my kids are uh, five, seven, and nine years old, and I'm a dog mom of two. Um, I currently work at um, Simmons University. I'm an adjunct professor there of um, closing it on six years. Um, I am running now because all of my professional experience and um, education is suited to this office as opposed to any other. I am a person who is um, has a tendency toward public service, always have. Um, and my daughter's going to kindergarten. So that's sort of the golden key, right? Suddenly I'm going to have some wiggle room and some elbow room and she'll be going to the full day program. So I'll have some some time to myself to do what I want and education is my passion and my profession. So I, it makes sense to me that this would be the office that I run for. What do you teach at Simmons? I teach research and evaluation in the master's program for social work. Okay. So obviously you have relevant experience. Do you want to be a little more specific than you've been able to be so far? Sure. Um, so I have a doctorate in human development and education. So um, that was my my terminal degree, and that's what I teach right now. I'm a research professor, researcher at heart, um, but I also hold a master's in social work. And in that program, I focused on schools and schooling services. Um, and then my undergraduate degree is in nursing. So I'm a registered nurse um, on top of that, and I've always worked in um, pediatrics and or the public health arena. So especially now, it feels as though it all sort of is coming together that the, the public health piece is being so, um, so importantly integrated into the education piece that to me it feels like a perfect fit. I'm trying, I'm a little bit flip here, but a little bit of an overachiever, are we? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's I like great. School. I like learning. Um, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's my, it's my comfort zone, education and, um, and schooling is my, is my place. That's great. That's great. I'm always happy to see that somebody really enjoys what they're doing. So what are things like in the school district now from your perspective as a parent? Uncertain. You know, um, I think anytime there's a there's an inability to plan in a, in, a, in a very concrete way. It requires a level of flexibility and fluidity that we really haven't had to experience in the past. We've never, I mean, certainly everyone keeps hearing the phrases, these are unprecedented times. This has never been done before. And that's exactly the feeling that I get um, from parents. You know, this is, no parents have ever had to 
homeschool like this before. Um, mm. Never really had a in this in our generations a situation that has been has required this level of shifting and pivoting from the general public. Mm. So I think there's a definite uncertainty, but I also see a lot of um, feelings of earnest. So I th with the uncertainty, we see teachers working extraordinarily hard, parents who are doing the best that they can in a situation that they don't necessarily know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we're seeing that duality, the, you know, the uncertainty and the, the need to want to return to normal as quickly as possible, which is a very normal urge. But then at the same time where, you know, we're seeing just the, the good in the, the work that people are doing in order to keep things moving forward as we're, as we're experiencing this and waiting to see what comes next. How are you experiencing the online schooling? I've been teaching online for eight years. Um, so this is, um, this, familiar. this is very familiar for me. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've taught at three different universities and, and Simmons right now in the online forums, um, in a multiple, on multiple platforms, uh, but most recently, Zoom. And so all of that is, um, that part of it is not something that I had to really make a big, um, a big switch to or pivot from. So if you were elected, what do you think is your biggest concern on that day? So you've been elected, you've been sworn in, and now what are you looking at? What's... So I think anytime there's a crisis, it's important to consider it from a, a hierarchy of needs, right? So if we consider like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it starts with the basics, right? So the food, clothing, and shelter, which many students rely on the schools for, um, once we have met that need, then we can move to the next level, which is the safety piece. And health is part of that. So mm -hmm. I think that the, the nursing hat will have to come on for a little while. And, um, and, and because I have worked so long in public health, that the, the considerations that it takes to move people through a public space is very different than what it takes to move them through a hospital or through a rehab or something like that. So um, the, the public health piece is going to have to be the next layer after, you know, the, 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 general, um, the general safety piece. And then after that comes the social and emotional piece. So the feeling of belonging and the, the feeling of being loved that our teachers are so good at showing our kids at school is what comes next. And then when we have those basic needs met, then we can get, engage in meaningful learning. But if we can't, we have to take care of those first. We can't, we can't jump over those right. to the education part. Right. And I know I have heard that uh, for some of the teachers, just the fact that they're not in the same classroom is emotionally traumatic for them. Oh, yeah. You know, um, but certainly, they have to be able to read the kids and know that whether it's that they're moving too much, they're fidgeting, they're, you know, whatever. Um, a lot of that is just from experience and watching it live and in color. Right. So, so um, how would you have the school committee address the concerns, starting with those basics and moving up? Maslow's hierarchy is my favorite, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think a lot of it's going to come from the state, the state guidelines um, from the, the Department of Education and from the Department of Health. I, I think that we're going to be given a lot of um, structure and guidelines as to how to best move forward. And then it will be our job to infuse best, best practices into that, whether it's on the ground and we're trying to, you know, in, envelop the public health piece into the school buildings themselves, or whether it's best practices for online learning, which are, I mean, there's a, an abundant literature on what that looks like. It is very hard to incorporate those things without without planning ahead of time. And we didn't have time to plan ahead of time. Yeah, so no. Everything was just hit the ground running, start going, do the best you can. And I think people are really doing the best that they can. We can do, we can do better. We always can do better. Um, yeah, and over the long term. It, I mean, it doesn't, just doesn't happen quickly. That's exactly. all. Exactly. So assuming the very worst for the upcoming 2021 school year, and will, that it will at least be disrupted to some extent by the virus. What do you hope to accomplish as a school committee person in your three-year terms? So you're not going in at a time when everything's just sort of humming along and you can build on um, what's been going on. You're just, you know, you know, 
What are you going? What are you? How are you going to measure your own success at the end of your term? So I sort of see this as being in um in two amorphous phases. So the first phase is this sort of crisis management that we're doing right now, but even as we go back in the fall, if by some stretch of miraculous wonder, there was no virus in the fall, uh, we would still be dealing with the ramifications of what happened now. Um, and so I think that we're still gonna be in sort of that crisis and um, reconstruction mode in the fall, no matter what. Um, Long-term sort of phase two after we get back to a, a normal, whenever that is, um, I'd like to see us um, focus on differentiated learning, which I think is gonna be even more important as we are moving to a, um, back into classrooms and kids are experiencing the homeschool experience differently. We're gonna have to really, and we do a, a good deal of it now, but we're gonna have to do a lot more of it in the future, not only at the elementary level, but also at the high school level, where um, I think that sometimes we, we need to do a little bit more of the differentiation. And I'd like to see more offerings at the high school level, um, more sort of um, metacognitive, experiences for them whether it's a you know an internship or an independent study or um, more self-directed learning but in a in a scaffolded way so that they're able to take ownership over their education and have a more meaningful um i mean more meaningful high school experience that's interesting so um I, as i mentioned in my opening comments the schools decided that they were going to change the opening times uh, for the older, well, middle school and high school kids, primarily based on you know health evaluations and the in interests of what the circadian rhythms permit with a teenager. Right. Uh, funny thing is, my teenager right now, just her rhythms are so off. <laughs> Good luck getting her to do anything, but that's beside the point. Um, so, do you feel that the um, opening time should be changed this fall, given all of the instability or uncertainty as you put it or not you know that whole the whole discussion around that topic happened in a completely different time where we had the luxury of these thought exercises of what if and if then and i don't know that we have that luxury anymore um, i think that you know from what i understand um, from watching the current school committee meetings about the the, the need for social distancing in on a bus on a school bus i mean that alone tells me that our school times are going to have to be readdressed mm. so, because you can't have the same sharing that we do now so our our school bus is going to be running like on a rotation where there'll be you know a new a new start time for everyone and we just don't know yet and some of it is a wait and see and some of it is um you know just using the building blocks we already have to imagine what we could do once we get the, the directives from the state. It's almost like everybody might get his own, huh? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. It seems um, the, the, busing, the busing would be difficult because I don't know how you, how you social distance on a bus, nor how you would clean them in between rounds in the oh, way yes. that- We're going from one grade, grade to the other. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure everybody realizes that, you know, we recircle, recycle buses all day long and they can be, you know, little kids, big kids and in-betweens. Right. Anyway, so new superintendent is coming or will likely, that will likely be the uh, situation. Um, what will you personally be looking for in a new superintendent? And do you think that this new superintendent could or should change things dramatically? Or not. I mean, I, it could certainly could, right? I mean, that's the that's a, a reality. Um, I hope that we find someone who is in tune with the nuances and originality that Holliston brings with it. And I don't know of any other towns that have the kind of programming that we already have between the French and the Montessori and the traditional. Um, so I think we're gonna to need to find someone who's really, who really gets us and understands that we are a unique place already. Never mind COVID and never mind the, you know, the shift that we have to go through. We've already got these nuances that they, um, that person's gonna to need to really come in and understand that it's gonna take them some time to, 
to fold in with the with the culture in Holliston, um, but that they also see that as a good thing and uh, as something that they want to be a part of. Yeah. Oh, it's true. I, I forget sometimes. I've been here for so long, but I forget sometimes that not everybody else. I think there's only one one other town that still does immersion, French immersion. So, anyway, looking ahead, do you anticipate any changes coming out of this stay-at-home experience uh, that might be applicable moving forward? I I, I hope so because the with the struggles comes the lessons and this is certainly a struggle so I certainly hope that we get some real gems of learning um, and experience out of this I I do think so I think that given the opportunity to reflect on this um, teachers parents administration I think everybody could pull something good out of this um, and everybody could make recommendations for improvements but even even already there's there's literature around the students that are actually thriving in this environment because of either you know anxiety issues or medical issues that the, the ability to stay home actually is opening up the world for them so it's not bad for everyone and we know it's not good for everyone so how do how to take those lessons and build them into a school system that services students the best way we know how is where i hope we go with this because there's a lot to be learned from what we're experiencing right now that fits into your differentiated education, right? Yeah, okay. Um, longer term, what is your biggest concern about Holliston schools? You know, moving forward, looking out however long you want to look out, your kids going into middle school, your kids going into high school. What are your concerns? Uh, concerns, I mean, I think it's, it goes without saying that the budget is a concern. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how we're going to, come out of this um, from a financial perspective is um, is going to be really important because no matter what we want to do we can't do it if we don't have the money so um, I do think that um, the, the, the budget is certainly a main concern I am concerned about the um, the levels of anxiety and um, mental health concerns in general issues of depression when people are returning to what I will call the normal um, because we are in a crisis and um, there's a lot that can resurface after after the return to safety from a mental health pr perspective so um, from a, a broad brush stroke if we're the, in the crisis phase right now when we get to the safe part is sometimes when you know once you're back to the island is when you're allowed to sort of um, you know feel all the feelings and experience the emotions that you were too afraid to let show before um, and I mean that proverbially and literally that there's just going to be some some portions that are going to surface later that we don't even know yet. So I think there's going to be a real need to um, be extremely pliable and um, show an extreme amount of agility when we're dealing with our students, when we're dealing with our faculty, the teacher staff, the administration, everyone's going to have to be sort of on their toes ready for the next move because we don't know what's coming next. And so I think the best thing we can do is to be really open-minded and ready for the unknown because we, we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. So because of that, we need to be able to be ready in the way that we're, we're kind of fielding the balls as they come. Okay, so now to town elections and town, town meeting. Um, have you participated in town elections and town meetings uh, while you've been here? How long have you been here? I didn't even ask you that. Uh, just over six years. Okay. Yeah. And you've had little kids all that time, so I appreciate that. Yeah, um, yeah I absolutely have voted um, and have participated in meetings. And when I get the chance, I like to bring my kids with me um, so that they can see and have memories of what it means to be a part of a community and what it means to vote and how important it is as as Americans that we have this right and um, and that they that they understand from a from an organic place what civ what civics education really is right so by just at the very ground level that they come with me on on voting day and they see what it's like and the woman who lives across the street from us is the one who checks us in and it's I just think that's really important for them to see all of that um, as they're as they're growing up so my last question is about town meeting, and it's always important to me. I do an awful lot of uh, shows on town meeting, 
why people don't go, how we could make it better, you know, do we offer drinks? <laughs> you know, we try to think of all, this, sure. all the silly things and all the weird things that we could do. <laughs> you know, I figure we're just setting out a bar out there. That would be the best. But at any rate, um, as it stands now, 100 people on average, you know, typically 100 people are basically casting votes for 10,000 voters, okay, 15,000 including kids and stuff, so 10,000. And we do have a governance, governance committee that's going to be looking at restructuring. Do we need to do anything different? You know, it could go to a representative town meeting, give up town meeting, go to a council. It could, you know, there's a, a variety of things that could be done or nothing could be done. So do you have any thoughts about improving attendance at town meetings and elections? What is it that, that we can do with the community to kind of raise that up? Because when you talk about it being a civic lesson, when you talk about it being, you know, any kind of history, this is about as good as it gets in terms of real democracy. And yet it's, it, it's you know, it's fragile, it's fragile. So just curious if you have any thoughts, especially as a relatively newcomer, you know, because generations change and thinking changes. Yeah. So, you know, I think we are right on the edge of another incredible learning experience with the mail-in voting and um and that whole experience that sometimes by shaking up the system you um you can get more people's attention mm -hmm. right so in some ways although this is unprecedented and difficult we might be able to actually elicit more information from people about what works and what doesn't work and communication and hierarchy and you know how things are perceived what are the perceived or real barriers to people coming to meetings to people coming to vote um, I think there's you know if we could I'm, I'm an evaluator this is what I do so the um, the idea of gathering more information and more um, data feedback mm -hmm. Um, is very close to my heart and to my thinking, my brain. So I think we could really collect some really interesting information from people about, you know, why they either do or don't engage or why they do sometimes, but not always. Is it topic related? Is it childcare related? Does everybody want cocktails? Like, what is it that, <laughs> that really is the driving force or the perceived barrier? And then if we can ascertain the barriers, how would we hone in on those so that we can make those seem less daunting as people come to participate well i do think that the cocktail idea could it, it, it could help with the budget even you know think about that we could. good <laughs> all right well thank you is there anything you want to add or say as a, as a parting uh, parting opportunity um i think that w what i hope that your viewers are um are taking away from this for me is that I feel well positioned to hold simultaneously the education piece and the health piece. And that I've done a lot of work with evaluating programs in Boston public schools and other districts in private schools as a consultant for nonprofits. Um, I have a lot of experience working within systems. My own, my dissertation was about family systems and about um, messaging and child behavior. So the messages that children receive from their parents and how that translates into child behavior. So I, I have always wanted to run for school committee. I've, I started having this conversation with another school committee member three years ago. It just so happens that right now we're in a, we're in a public health crisis. Um, and so these are, these are my spheres of, of existence um, and it's sort of where where we are right now um, so that's what I, I hope is the takeaway is that the education that I have and the practical experience that I have has prepared me well for where we are right now and my kids are little and we're gonna be here for a while so I'm I'm in it we're here and I I'd like to help well, thank you for that, because not everybody is willing to, so there's that. But I'm going to thank you, and then I'm going to say a few more words, because part of, part of my goal here is to make everybody aware that this election is a little bit different. Um, because of the COVID issue, and because of w the worry of exposing people to a whole lot of other people, the election will be, only, will be held on June 23rd, first of all. 
And then second of all, it will only be from 12 to four. Wow, you might say, how can I possibly? Well, the point is that really the hope is everybody will vote by mail. As many people as possible, um, that we're hoping, will do that. And that will then minimize how many people might be gathered at the gym that might be in the line somewhere there, either at the precinct level or to get into the building or whatever. Just try to minimize how many folks might be exposed. We also have the poll workers that we need to think about who are there. We don't really want them exposed unnecessarily. So to vote by absentee ballot, you have to go through a couple of steps. You go, through, go to the town's website, click on that, at the bottom of the first page, it says absentee ballot or how to vote absentee or something to that effect. Click on that. And you'll come to an application form. Fill out the form. You can email that form, print it out so you can sign it. But then you can scan it and email it back to town hall. And the town clerk's office will mail you by snail mail a real ballot, the full, full ballot. You cast your ballot and then you seal it up in the little envelope and you let the post office take it back. And people have been doing it already. I mean, there are a couple of hundred people who have voted already. Um, so I want everybody to be aware that the process is different and don't you know, miss out on voting, um, but try to vote early if you can so that you don't expose yourself or anybody else. And that's about that. All right, Mary Catherine, good luck. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, and um, I'm sure I'll see you around somewhere. Take care. Bye-bye.